Since the beginning of the so-called war on terror 20 years ago, we observe a severe erosion of human rights worldwide. Medical Care Service for Refugees and the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights cooperated in these years on several occasions to highlight the absolute prohibition of torture and demanding to stop the systematic impunity of those responsible for crimes against humanity. We observed that even in countries where torture was proscribed, torture came back in many police stations, prisons, detention camps around the world. But not only torture was used with the motive to fight against terrorism. International human rights treaties were undermined. Torture was legitimized with enhanced interrogation techniques. New laws enabled governments to surveillance of citizens. Drones were used for targeted killings. All these measures were intended to hunt terrorists. But in all these cases, innocent people became the target. Only last week, the US Defense Department had to confess that the drone attack in Kabul end of August was that was first declared as an act of revenge for an attack one week earlier by ISIS that killed 13 US soldiers and more than 160 Afghan civilians as a failure. First, the US declared that the drone attack was successful and killed alleged terrorists. Now they had to confess that the drone attack killed 10 civilians, among them seven children. Tonight, we want to discuss how it is possible to take legal steps against these crimes against humanity and or war crimes. Our two experts represent NGOs that are specialized in the fight against impunity, and they will tell us which strategies and tactics were used to bring cases of human rights violations in court. Andrea Schöller works for the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights in Berlin. This organization has a lot of experience in strategic litigation in regard to torture cases, in regard to Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, rendition flights, and illegal detention camps. Together with Barashi Ban from the NGO Reprieve in the UK, they tried to take legal steps against the use of drones in Yemen that killed more than 1,300 people, among them at least around 200 civilians. Andreas, 20 years of war on terror also means 20 years of erosion of international human rights law on the pretext of counterterrorism. Which legal, which legal tricks did the US use to enable this erosion and what are international consequences? Yeah, thank you very much for the um, kind introduction and thank you very much also for um, inviting me to this uh, great series of events on 20 years of war on terror. Um, and as to your question, basically what we are talking about since 9-11, uh, since the attacks in the U.S. happened um, since 20 years ago, is, is a reaction by the U.S. and allies, which was um, completely outside of the law by fighting um, al-Qaeda in an endless war that still um, continues until to date, um, renditions, torture, uh, mass surveillance, drone strikes, as, as you named it and also um, killing um, suspects or those responsible rather than um, prosecutions uh, or bring them in, in front of a court. So basically the reaction um, of the US, but also European allies set aside uh, what we knew as international law, as human rights law, as international humanitarian law in the reaction. And I think the um, interesting part here is that also most often it wasn't done openly, basically saying that um, we, we don't respect the law, we, we do what we want to do, but rather the US and, and others were still trying to um, basically change the law or reinterpret it or trying to justify the actions under, under a, a legal framework. Um, so, so that continued, but it, uh, they did it in a, uh, an extent that basically it, um, the, the law lost its function in terms of regulation or criminalization of, of conduct and, and, and so on. And 
And there are a number of examples here. Um, there's a pretty long list. I just want to name a few. Um, there's the um, notion, of course, of any enemy combatants the U.S. used in, in Guantanamo, basically for detainees there to put them outside all um, legal protection, be it under human rights law, be it under international humanitarian law, with creating such a new category. Um, there are the um, well-known torture memos um, by the um, Justice Department at the time in the U.S., which were um, serving to justify that the um, torture techniques would still um, not be in violation of, of international and domestic law, especially the UN Convention Against Torture. Um, so there they tried to argue um, in, in, with, with, with um, a legal backing, basically, um, that, that they were not not outside the law. Um, then there was the notion of preventive um, self-defense that was used to wage the war in Iraq, um, and also in drone strikes, drone attacks. It's used a lot that um, that that uh, the use of force in a number of different countries by drones is also to prevent um, um, attacks uh, against the U.S. but also um, European allies, for example. Um, so these are some examples, and there is the. Um, authorization of use of force, um, AUMF, um, in the U.S., which um, which allows basically the, the U.S. president to go to war without um, approval by Congress um, um, against Al Qaeda and associates, and this associates was interpreted again in a, such a large. Um, uh, interpretation that it, it basically covers each and every every group and also state uh, and, and and even those that are not not affiliated with Al Qaeda. So it, it gives a blank check basically to the U.S. president to go to war um, without domestic approval, um, wherever he wants, and it, it has been used in a lot of times basically whenever. For example, armed drones are used in, in a number of different states. Uh, it was based um, um, on this provision in, 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 in U.S. law. So um, these are some examples, um, especially when it comes to the global war um, notions the U.S. is using that they are basically um, worldwide at war with Al-Qaeda. So that means that regular laws are not applying, human rights law um, wouldn't apply if at all, then only international humanitarian law, which then the U.S. also um, loosens by um, um, by reinterpreting who, who who can be a target under international humanitarian law rules, um, so that as many as people as possible can be attacked, um, and they put it all under the war notion because I'm under international humanitarian law, the protection of civilians is much weaker than under human rights law. Um, so th these are just some examples, and you know you could go into detail on, on 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 many of them, but they all contribute basically to an erosion of international law. Other states followed the reinterpretation of the law by the U.S., um, and other states uh, don't oppose it. So basically, this leads, internationally speaking, over the last twenty years to to such an erosion of international law, of human rights law. Um, um, and 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 the protection of civilians, the protection of human rights, uh, um, is, is is less and less based on, um, yeah, basically those those attacks, reinterpretation, justifications. The um, U.S. but also a lot of European states used uh, as as in the war on terror and as a reaction to 9/11. Yeah, so what um, at the is European Center for Constitution and Human Rights that you exist since 2007. So it was uh, not easy to find good strategies how to bring uh, cases uh, in the, that has to do with the, uh, with the war on terror before court. So what were your first strategies to, to get these things before court? Can you tell us a little bit how it was at the beginning and how it developed over the time? Yeah, basically, it all started uh, already before um, the ECCHR has been created um, by its co-founder, Wolfgang Karlek, who, as a lawyer for the Center for Constitutional Rights in the U.S., 
uh, brought the first criminal complaints in Germany against um, Donald Rumsfeld, George Tenet, and the kind of architects of the U.S. torture program um, in 2004 and 2006 on what happened in Guantanamo in Abu Ghraib um, under, under the principle of universal jurisdiction. Um, because basically there is an absolute prohibition of torture globally. There is um, the UN Convention Against Torture. There is the obligations by all states globally to uh, investigate and prosecute torture or to extradite torturers. Um, so that's that was used um, um, also in Germany to bring those cases um, against um, the architects of the US torture program. Um, and at ECCHR, we continue to, to work on that by um, bringing and supporting cases of former detainees from Spain, from France and those countries. Um, trying to get investigations going in, in, in these countries um, on, on behalf of basically the, their citizens who were tortured in Guantanamo. Um, it led, for example, to, um, to, to, to the summon of um, the first Guantanamo commander, Geoffrey Miller, by the French judiciary um, as a suspect so that he um, was summoned to come to France to, um, uh, to, to, to um, yeah, basically answer questions um, on, on the allegations against him. Um, um, there were um, some travel warnings by the U.S. spoken out after this and, and already before, actually, that people involved in the U.S. torture program should be um, careful in traveling to or via Europe because of um, some legal complaints pending or being filed so that they might get um, summoned there or, or arrested and questioned. Um, so these were some actions we took in the, in the early years. And then when more and more evidence came up in the U.S. through the um, U.S. Senate report uh, on, on, on the military, but then also in 2014 on, on the CIA, uh, the CIA torture report, we filed another set of cases um, in Germany, uh, including against the um, uh, later CIA director, Gina Haspel, who was uh, involved in the black side uh, of the CIA in Thailand in 2001 and 2002. Um, so a number of cases there, again, to show that um, that that's, has been all criminal behavior that people um, should face a judge and, 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 and stand trial in court if, if they would travel um, anywhere. Um, so basically to um, put out some warnings and also to um, address that they should be treated as um, also other torture suspects from um, other and, and, and less powerful countries um, and, and that they should be equal before the law. So if, if they would ever um, set a foot into Europe, basically that they would have to face uh, consequences here. Um, it on, also informed an investigation by the International Criminal Court, um, which has only jurisdiction on Afghanistan, but with um, Bagram Air Base, with the CIA um, rendition program um, in, in Afghanistan. So there are also some links there to the U.S. torture program, obviously. So that was also supported. Um, and we still hope, actually, for an ICC investigation um, into U.S. torture um, concerning at least the uh, situation in Afghanistan, which is still pending, which um, is, is still very open what the ICC will do there and which focus, but um, that's, that, that would be um, extremely important from our perspective. Um, and maybe just to um, finish here, I know we, we're gonna speak about that a bit later, is then um, um, our litigation we brought against uh, drone strikes because then under 2009, under the Obama administration, torture and tradition stopped, but um, drone strikes were taken up um, and targeted killings in an um, extreme um, um, big number in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Libya. Um, so these were cases we um, brought to court in Germany together with reprieve, um, especially for the use of the Rammstein Air Base. Um, but I think we're going to speak about that a bit later, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Farad, you are, you are a human rights activist from Yemen and you are working with Reprieve. Can you just tell us a little bit what kind of organization that is? What activities are you doing there? Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, the um, Reprieve um, has, I mean, it started as an organization 
um, focused on um, death penalty uh, cases um, and advocates for the abolition of um, uh, death penalty uh, worldwide and uh, started taking a number of cases in, in the United States. Um, and then as the war on terror started to um, come, come into shape in, in around uh, 2001, 2000 and, uh, 2002, um, reprieve kind of jumped in into a situation where we saw um, it's it's the um, it's the uh, erosion of uh, the basic principles of uh, what people consider um, um, when when you when when people were being transferred to um, to uh, to Guantanamo and we had this weird um, definition by uh, George W. Bush and by his national security team at the at the at the time who said actually those are not enemy combatants and they were um, uh, captured uh, without wearing military gear and therefore the geneva convention does not uh, does not apply and a, a the design of guantanamo was in a way that um, uh, avoids or it's basically um, you have a space um, and, 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 and um, which, which which exists but does it actually uh, is not in really tied to any particular law. So you can't actually try them in the US because technically they're not in the US. And um, it's, it's not bar part of uh, Cuba because the land has been um, basically, uh, it's, a, it's kind of an a, arrangement where the US has, uh, has rented the, the land, but in, in a weird way, only the US can and this uh, this contract, not the not the Cuban, uh, not the Cuban, uh, not the Cuban government. But anyway, the the war on terror then started to develop into taking different forms and shapes. So Reprieve started tracking renditions, black sites that were being created in different parts of the uh, different parts of the world, and we saw the increased um, use of uh, allies of the United States, particularly the United Kingdom at that time, but also a number of uh, European uh, governments, and, um, and 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 from there, the, the uh, reprieve started uh, working on the uh, the drone program. As basically, it shaped um, how uh, the uh, the different actually administrations, um, beginning from Bush, but then moving to Obama, and then going to Trump, and now with Biden. Uh, all of them seem to have a lot of a lot. They they disagree almost in, on, on almost everything, but they agree that all of them united uh, um, can uh, can continue doing extrajudicial killings um, in countries like Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, Libya, and a long list of uh, long list of of, um, uh, of, uh, of countries. So basically, I joined Reprieve in in uh, 2012. And really, it was during the Obama period, the Obama administration, when the peak of the uh, of the uh, drone program was was very, very basically um, uh, present in 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 uh, in, in Yemen, um, and uh, it continued under the the um, the Obama administration, and and um, I started. Um, going to uh, villages, uh, remote areas, and investigating uh, a number of those strikes. And basically, what we saw was basically a change of the of of the uh, the, the the dynamics on the ground. Basically, in all the areas where the the uh, the war and terror was more um, was more present and more apparent, is is where you would see an erosion of the normal. Uh, um, Rule of law. Basically, you cannot have a police uh, a police work or law enforcement's work in a in a community or a local community where there's constant drones um, hovering and striking in the in the uh, in the area. Um, and I I I can't remember how many how many cases I've I've I've, I've came across, but I've went to places where weddings have been hit. Uh, and um, uh, in, a, in an instance, there was an, the very famous case of an, an uh, anti-Al-Qaeda imam who basically was preaching against Al-Qaeda on the Friday right before he was killed by a drone strike. He was killed with his nephew, who was a, who was a policeman. And, um, and, and many, many, other, many other, uh, other, other cases that continue to, uh, to, uh, to, to take place in, in, in Yemen. And although at this few months under the Biden administration, there isn't that 
uh, there, there isn't any increase or clear signs where the drone program is going to uh, head towards, but um, there hasn't been any really commitment by the Biden administration to do a really full review of the of the of the program and um, how uh, how will this change uh, 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 how will this change moving forward? But it's it's within a context that is a little bit complicated, which is the situation in Yemen, which I think I'll I'll be speaking in a, in, a, in a few minutes. Thank you so much. So before we move on to the uh, to the issue of the uh, drone strikes, I just want to come back very shortly to the torture question. Um, so as you said, the rendition flights are over the black sites. They don't exist anymore, as we hope. And um, now we still have the problem that Guantanamo still exists. So the other presidents since George Bush, they did not really achieve to close it. Now there are still 39 persons being detained there. So what, is, what, is the, what was the problem for the US government uh, during the last year that they could not close it? And do you see um, that, that, it should be, that it can be closed in the near future? So what will be what will be happening with Guantanamo? So um, there's Amnesty International that is doing a big campaign to close it down, but yeah. So how can it be successful? Um, I mean, I think, of course. I mean, morally, ethically, and legally, um, Guantanamo should have been closed a long, uh, a long time ago. And uh, it is still, I, I would say, it's a, it, it would continue to be a stain in the, um, in the American history that at a certain period of time, there is basically consecutive presidents who decided that it's actually, it is okay to, um, to hold people indefinitely. It is pretty much fine to hold people without a trial and to... Uh, try to make the public, you know, coexist with the fact that actually we would have a we would have um, a detention site that uh, that uh, does not adhere to nor the international law or the or the U.S. Uh, or the U.S. Uh, or the U.S. law. Um, I think whenever there is a will, there is a way. If there was a will within the American administration to end this chapter. They will find a way to close the uh, to to uh, to close uh, uh, to, to to basically close Guantanamo. Um, of course, if you try to be stuck on the technicalities and the bureaucracy of the American administration, you will find many excuses why you can't uh, um, you know close um, close the prison in in, um, in in Guantanamo. But we have a number of cases that have been the individuals have been cleared for release. Basically, people who have gone through different, um, different uh, uh, proceedings um, um, being reviewed by the different yeah, US intelligence services, the national, basically from the CIA to the NSA to different, um, to different bodies within the US government. And they're still being, uh, they're still being, uh, being held. Um, in, 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 in this case, I, uh, I, uh, I personally have met the families of the of the Guantanamo, uh, of the of the of the Guantanamo detainees, and um, for uh, for all of the what what many people would see from 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 far and beyond, um, when you come to know them, they're just regular citizens. They uh, don't know why their sons are being held indefinitely, um, and they will repeat basically tell me the same question: If they have anything, why are not? They they being brought to court. Why don't we see a normal procedure being uh, being uh, being followed here? Um, I know in a certain case where the the basically the mother and her son were studying um, the 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 uh, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, legal system and trying to find if there is any precedence where the U.S. have uh, have have done this. And it was very complicated when you're trying to explain to a family that. By the way, the laws that apply to American citizens it really doesn't apply to your sons, and your uh, your sons also not just that they're not even you know uh, they will not be uh, going through a normal procedure of you know people who have been caught in a in a conflict or uh, the Geneva Convention even does not uh, does not uh, does not apply uh, apply to them. So I think again, and on 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 the face of it, people can put 
puts many, many obstacles. But um, in reality, really, if there is a will, uh, there is a way. And, and I think this is, it's more the burden on the American, on the American, pe uh, on the American people and, and the American public and the Western governments uh, in general. Is this a legacy that they would need to leave for many decades or generations? Um, or let's say it's time to close this chapter and move on. Andreas, do you want to say something about that? Because so Obama, he declared at, at the very beginning of his presidency that he's going to close it. But with Trump, we did not really <laughs> believe that he would close it. But now Biden has also declared that it's his plan to close it as soon as possible. So what do you think about that? Well, I can only second what Farah said. It's uh, depending on the will. It's, uh, uh, it's in inexplicable and it's an, an absolute disgrace, basically, that it's still open and there's no alternative to closing it and shutting it down from all different perspectives, uh, uh, looking looking into that. And, and if there is a will, they will also find a way, but the will is still not strong enough. And, and like that, you have a... Um, you, you have a state there which basically puts some people um, completely outside the law for so many years. Um, I mean, some are now almost spending 20 years in Guantanamo. That's a large part of their life. Um, it's nothing you can kind of compensate in, in any, any form anyway. Um, so basically, there's only one way to, to close it, and it needs to be um, demanded um, um, not only by Amnesty International but also still by the German government by many other European governments um, and, and first own and forms of course in the US um, um, it, it can't be a forgotten issue which is still there and, and no one is interested any, any more about that and just leaves the, leaves the people um, rot there so I think this is only one solution and um, we'll close it in, in whichever way as soon as possible frustrating but that also means that we have to make a lot of public pressure so to influence the political will perhaps so let's hope for that okay let's now go to the situation in Yemen uh, because this is the issue for tonight so Bara, could you please please tell us a little bit the background of this war so how did it evolve from the war on terror until this very terrible war that is still going on. Yes, um, uh, allow me at the beginning, I would like to pay uh, tribute for uh, nine innocent victims who were being, who, who, who were executed over the, uh, over, the uh, over the weekend by a Houthi run court. Um, those uh, nine, uh, nine individuals were basically abducted uh, from their homes and, and, uh, and villages of, uh, during uh, between September and November 2018, and then the Houthis accused them of being agents and spies for the um, for the Saudi and U.S. Uh, and U.S. governments, and accused them of being of a plot of assassinating one of their uh, leaders. Not uh, it's worth to mention one of them um, uh, was a child. Um, uh, unfortunately, they they lacked any basic um, a basic. Uh, uh, rights, which is they, they, their lawyer was not allowed even to submit his, uh, his defense. He was not allowed to meet them. Uh, they, they, they were tortured brutally. And on the day of the ex execution on last Saturday, the child was brought literally who was being lifted up because he has been paralyzed because of the torture he endured. And unfortunately, all of them got, um, got uh, executed. So I need to pay, uh, to pay tribute to those people. And I hope from that people I can I'll be able to expand on to what is the exact situation on on on, on Yemen. Uh, in Yemen, the, the 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 more simple way, if I if I would like to simplify it to the people, uh, imagine you are seeing Afghanistan. It's a very similar situation, very uh, 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 similar conditions that Yemen have went through. But what happened in Afghanistan that we saw in the last uh, couple of uh, weeks, in in especially in August. Uh, we saw that happening in Yemen in September 2014. So the, the state structure started to quickly collapse. Um, and the Houthis, which is an armed, it's a theological movement and, and, an, and, an, armed, uh, and an armed militia, 
uh, started to gain uh, momentum quickly. And in September, it was able to take control over the, uh, the, uh, the capital Sana'a. Um, the collapse was, was, was quick, but the, the government didn't collapse entirely. So it was able still to hold some territory and it's still legitimate on paper and still enjoys international recognition. So you have this situation where you have the capital and the north of the country is still being captured by the, by the, uh, by the Houthis. Um, and uh, the Houthis uh, were able to get a lot of weapons similar to the Taliban weapons from the, uh, the Yemeni military stockpiles, uh, uh, but also were, were in, in, especially after 2014, started to get a lot of funding coming from, uh, from Iran. Um, and you have the Yemeni government who, was, who basically uh, was weak and unfortunately still, still weak and uh, is still holding some, uh, some territory and, push on, and trying to push back against the, uh, against, the, um, uh, against the Houthis. The Houthis, similar to the Taliban in their attitude, there is no respect to the rule of law. There's no respect to, 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 to human rights. There is no really uh, um, uh, adherence to the international law or to the MNE law for that, uh, for that matter, matter. And at the same time, the same Kind of condescending treatment towards towards uh, women. Uh, so we saw, uh, unfortunately, what what we would call the Arab Spring generation, who came up in an uprising in 2011. There was a campaign of arrest, detention, and uh, summary executions being carried uh, against them, mainly uh, at the time by the uh, by the uh, uh, by the Houthis. This basically escalated in, two, in March 2015 when the Houthis started doing military maneuvers with, uh, at the border with Saudi Arabia. And that prompted an, an, an intervention by a coalition led by, uh, by Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia. And the situation became, become, became even more and more uh, complicated. Unfortunately, instead of backing up the state institutions, the, uh, the Saudi-led coalition um, uh, decided to rely on the United Arab Emirates to, um, to, to back up its military efforts. And in the south of the country where they've been successful into pushing the Houthis, they started to um, finance and create armed groups. And under the pretext of the war on terror, they said our shift now is, 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 folk, is, is changed to basically targeting uh, Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda plots and sympathizers, and 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 it started including many many different people. So they they created basically secret detention sites in the south of uh, in the south of, of Yemen, and basically you have this complex situation. You have a government that is legitimate on paper, enjoys international recognition. It's supposed to be in control over the the land, but really on 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 the interim capital in Aden, south of Yemen, uh, it's more controlled by a UAE backed militia. Uh, that is unfortunately committing similar similar atrocities to what the Houthis are doing in the north of the of the of the, of the country. Uh, the situation can, unfortunately continues to deteriorate, where the economic uh, the uh, economical basically situation in Yemen is deteriorating very fast, um, and the uh, Yemeni real is losing its its value, and many many people starting to lose, especially the public sector are not being paid. They haven't been paid for the last. I think two and a half years until until now. So that basically had an impact on the humanitarian situation because if the economy is not moving, then you know that would affect the um, the, the situation. Now going back to uh, to what um, the, the 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 U.S. involvement during that period, especially after the Arab Spring, the hopes were high. People were very optimistic about a new future, a democratic future for uh, for for Yemen. But really, the interest at the uh, at the especially at the United States, but in Western governments, was how can we combat uh, combat Al Qaeda? And the discussion always basically focused on can we have more drone strikes? How can we be more precise with our drone strikes? How can we um, uh, work with uh, the uh, Yemeni intelligence to to uh, to uh, to enhance the counterterrorism programs? While I think the discussion should have been how can you enhance the state institutions, the problem of Yemen has been for a long time, the institutions has been fragile and you need to, to support basically the development, you need to, to, to uh, support the rule of law um, and you need to work with, uh, the, uh, with the local communities 
to prevent basically a, a, a deterioration of the, of the situation because unfortunately any group, if it's Al Qaeda or any armed, other armed groups, really flourishes in vacuum. They flourishes when they flourish when there is no uh, rule of law, when there is an absence of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the state apparatus. And unfortunately, I would say until today, we haven't been able to come eye, eye to eye with different American administrations that your focus needs to shift into supporting um, a system that respects and enhances the, 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 uh, uh, the rule of law and would be inclusion to more uh, to, 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 to the whole of Yemen, instead of uh, focusing your whole Yemen policy into this small, very narrow minded, which is just counterterrorism, are only interested in Yemen because it can potentially be a threat in the in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the future, and uh, and this unfortunately started with the former president uh, um, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who who ruled the country for uh, uh, 33 uh, 33 years. Um, the the U.S. supported and financed the creation of the um, the the uh, the intelligence branch, which committed many 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 atrocities. But what we saw happen afterwards, the Houthis basically inherited the uh, intelligence service. They inherited the stockpile of weapons by, uh, supplied by the United States in order to uh, uh, counter terrorism. And the state institutions that are supposed to support and protect the Yemeni citizens um, collapsed. And, um, and, and unfortunately, this is still the situation until, until today. Thank you very much. This context is so important because the, uh, the, the, the relation between the war on terror and the war in Yemen is not very clear to everybody. So thank you very much for giving this context. Um, yeah, but perhaps you can explain a little bit why the U.S. take the, the drone strikes as military strategic tool and why is it in Yemen so extensively so there were I think about three about 300 attacks um, during the last years so what is the strategy of the US government behind it so of course you we can think about doing a war where less US soldiers get hurt and die um, was there in the international human rights law never a regulation on drone attacks? On drones? Um, the 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 relation drones is a is a is a very strange um, form of uh, form of war. If I would, if I would, if I would say because um, basically you're trying to you you basically made an assumption that uh, technology works. So basically, we less rely on uh, um, uh, human uh, resources, and we rely heavily on um, uh, uh, tracking, and tracing, and surveillance. Um, and then, highly depending on 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 uh, on technology, we say we're going to then deploy a number of drones who can keep surveilling communities um, for a long period of time. And then we can prevent a strike or prevent a possible threat. Uh, by um, by an armed group or individuals of an armed group before it actually takes place, and th when it, when it comes to it, you're really um, trying to legalize a and uh, basically it's a form of extrajudicial killing. You've killed people without being tried, without holding any charges um, uh, charges against them, and then you think this actually this actually works. It actually will will enhance. Um, you know your um, your security in the future. I would say in in the current situation in Yemen, um, nor Yemenis nor its neighbors, nor the inter the wider international community is safe. When you have a collapse of the uh, of the of the of the structure, I have went myself to those local communities, and I could tell you it was very frightening. I couldn't stay for a couple of nights because you're constantly um, hearing a drone buzzing basically over your head. You don't know when. You don't know where it's going to uh, to, to to strike. And I remember in 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 one of the strikes, um, and and I think this will summarize for you a lot of a lot of what people are trying to understand about this program. I went to a local village where a wedding was was hit by a by a by a by a drone strike. And I remember I met the leader of the community, and he said, "I was very hopeful about the Arab Spring." I participated in the in the in the protests and I went for the elections. I was very excited about our future. 
But what happened is he said after 2011, the drone program basically expanded and uh, their community become one of the most hit. And his, his, his specific family from 2011 until today, the 40 members of his family who have, been, uh, who have been killed in different strikes, including children, including women. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and I remember I, I went to there and I saw there was a school, but there's nobody teaching. And I said, I want to meet the teacher. Eventually after many months, I was able to meet this uh, teacher. And I said, why have you, why, why are there no, no longer teachers? He said, who's going to stay when there is a drone over your head? Who, what teacher, what kind of system do you think? And so basically the, the, um, the structure that people relate to as a, as, a, as a modern civil state, which people see is a, um, a courts operating, police uh, present, um, a, a school, a hospital, all of that forms, started to basically slowly and slowly disappear um, to the ben benefits of basically vacuum. You have a, 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 a village and a local community who are constantly uh, afraid. That same community then were hit by, uh, there was a, a, one of the first actions uh, acts by uh, then President Trump was to conduct a raid on this, uh, on this, on this, uh, on this village. It killed 23 people, including 16 of them were women and children. And uh, the entire, imagine an entire village had to, uh, uh, had to move and then were constantly displaced. They kept hiding, trying to go to uh, mountainous areas, hide behind trees, to basically as much as possible, try to avoid being tracked by, uh, by uh, the drones that were, uh, that were um, uh, hovering ahead. And unfortunately, that's not a story of one community. There are many, many communities. And many of those communities are the most vulnerable, the most poor communities in, in, uh, in Yemen, who slow, basically sooner or later will start losing faith uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the Yemeni state or, you know, you know, or in the ability of just them living a, uh, living a, a, um, a normal life. Um, uh, it's this interacts into many things. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine if, if you would have people living here in London or people in Berlin who can, can endure just a few, a few days of living in, in that environment of, um, uh, environment of fear. So it creates, it's also a form of terrorism to the people that traumatizes all community, whole communities. Andreas, perhaps you could explain us a little bit. Um, the USA, they legitimized these targeted killings with drones and in the international human rights law, is there any regulation that we can use uh, to declare these war crimes? Or does, or does it still not exist? So what is the situation on the international level? I mean, when we started to work um, on drones um, um, uh, with reprieve, especially on the, on the case of um, the Ibn Ali Jabba family, um, that's the case we brought together in Germany um, on, on the use of Rammstein Airbase in the global US drone program. Um, um, back then, it was in 2014, um, we, we observed already five years of, or, or even more of drone strikes in Yemen. Um, in, in a situation in a country, Barra just described, which was um, 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 rather peaceful. You had the um, Arab Spring at protests, you had um, a, a national dialogue at uh, um, changes, but it was um, still before um, the, the war by the, Saudi, by the Saudi coalition was was waged and, and, and launched. So it was a quite different situation in 2014. And there, for example, we argued that the drone strikes take place um, outside armed conflicts because um, there was no armed conflict in Yemen and particularly there was no armed conflict between the US and, and any actor within Yemen, um, um, except for the US drone strikes as, as the act of violence. So it, it didn't fulfill the kind of legal parameters you need to, um, to be in a situation of an armed conflict where you need 
um, exchange of um, violence to a certain level by um, at least two actors and groups that are um, organized and 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 can maintain um, kind of exchange of hostilities for for longer time and and and, and so on. So um, so we didn't see there an, an, an armed conflict. Um, nor did we actually see it afterwards um, when it comes to the drone strikes because they were uh, not directly connected to the war um, by the Saudi coalition, but continued um, basically unilateral, um, um, unilateral by the, uh, by the US um, um, uh, in, in, in certain regions of Yemen. So this whole um, question, is it in armed conflict or outside? What I um, in the begin beginning said that the US sees itself in a global war on terror. They, they say that um, um, they are at, uh, in an armed conflict um, worldwide. So that's, that's the first um, legal position which we um, reject, which not only we reject, also the German federal prosecutor rejects, for example, in one opinion, um, um, also other um, institutions at UN level reject this. So you need to look um, regionally and there in, in Yemen, we, we kind of still dispute that it's part of a um, armed conflict in which the drone strikes are happening. And that's quite important because in armed conflict, you have... Um, um, you have international humanitarian laws that applies, it gives less protection to civilians. Um, human rights law still applies, but um, but not fully. So it's a bit it's more restricted. Um, so basically, it's a question you come from peace times to potential state of emergencies where some laws are not in place anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you come to um, war times where even less legal protection exists. So these are the parameters we are, we are talking about here. And, um, and the US tries to put it in a box where basically a less legal restriction is um, applicable, whereas we argue that um, it's outside armed conflict. So the full body of human rights law um, applies and that would basically restrict um, or actually prohibit drone strikes because in, um, in, in, in times outside and of an armed conflict, um, as it is here, you can only use um, uh, lethal force uh, and kill people in self-defense. And self-defense means not for any abstract potential threat at one point in the future, but only in a very concrete situation where, where you are threatened. And that's the only way you can react to that. Um, um, and, and, and in a drone strike scenario, that's basically never the case because you only have a drone un, uh, unmanned, un, uh, flying un, un, in, in the airspace um, and people on the ground. So you never come even in this uh, direct threat situation where you could apply lethal force to defend yourself and your own life. Um, so basically under human rights laws, the drone strikes are unlawful and then um, then we are not talking about basically war crimes because they can only happen in armed conflict. But here we are talking um, about uh, murder cases and assassinations um, um, in, in legal terms. And, um, um, and, 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 and so, so that, that's different. And these are the legal differences which are quite important here. And, um, um, and this forms a bit a part of our um, constitutional complaint we filed on Rammstein, but um, but it's it's only one layer on on, 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 a, on a more complex case. Okay, so then please explain us your case that you did here in Germany and uh, what also and if there are also at the uh, parallelly um, cases in other countries that also try to. Uh, stop these drone strikes. So you mentioned already, first to, to make this clear for the audience, you said before that the drone strikes by the US are coordinated here in Germany in the Rammstein Air Base, military base. Yeah, let me say a few words on Rammstein and, and I think that Mozabara can add on the litigation, especially for the family, uh, which um, um, is also not only taking place in Germany. Um, so um, together with Reprieve, we, we developed this case um, um, in Germany because the um, US airbase in Rammstein is a quite important 
location for the um, um, U.S. global drone program, for the global capacities of the U.S. to use armed drones uh, in many different countries. And, um, and, and the main reason is that there's a so-called um, distributed ground system at, at Rammstein Air Base, which is um, which only exists five times um, worldwide, and 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 three times uh, it's it's located in the U.S. and is the only one in Europe is in Rammstein, and I think then there's another one, um, I, um, I think in in Korea, and so um, this distributed ground system is basically. Uh, and, and a hub where a lot of data is going through is being analyzed um, and and you need a lot of um, bandwidth also to transfer data um, to drones and from drones back into the um, operational channels um, for for analysis for decision making for surveillance and all of that um, I mean we all know it when we um, stream um, in the event online like tonight, um, um, you need a good internet connection because it, it takes a lot of data and, and uh, drones are constantly streaming basically images. So they need really good um, data um, channels and connections to be able to do, uh, to survey real time, but then also to basically take um, actions and um, perform drone strikes in real time. And for that, uh, to have these stable and, and, and broad internet connections as a satellite relay station in addition to the distributed ground system or as part of it in Rammstein, which um, um, basically connects the um, airspace of Yemen and other countries um, via satellite to Rammstein Airbase and then by fiber optic cable, the data goes to the US um, um, where other teams are sitting, which are basically coordinating and directing um, the and taking the drone strike. and. Um, so basically, um, this whole data system on which um, <laughs> a lot um, um, depend on, on, on Rammstein Airbase. Without Rammstein Airbase, um, the US wouldn't have the capacities. They still would have capacities, but um, um, smaller ones to, um, to maintain the global drone program. Um, in, in, one doc in some documents, um, Rammstein was called a single point of failure. Um, um, by, by the US military, so it, it shows the meaning of the airbase, and that's why we went to court um, basically against the um, German government, um, arguing that Germany um, is complicit in drone strikes um, because they are unlawful for many different reasons we, we already explained, and that Germany has the obligation to basically stop the use uh, of the Rammstein airbase um, for the global drone program. Um, and that was litigated in different courts. The um, higher administrative court in Münster um, um, two, three years back uh, ruled in favor of our complaint and kind of um, 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 confirming our, our legal argumentation uh, on the unlawfulness. Um, unfortunately, that was overturned last year or earlier this year, actually, by the um, federal administrative court in Leipzig. And... Um, as, as a reaction, we filed a constitutional complaint to the federal constitutional court in Germany, where, where the case is currently pending. Um, and we hope for um, for a hearing next year, um, because of course a number also of constitutional questions um, at stake here, um, especially also um, um, you know how far the obligation by the German government goes to take actions against the U.S. and how much um, courts can review. Um, uh, the legal position of Germany uh, in, 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 in with regard to the, um, to the drone program. So these are all questions at stake here. It's one emblematic case, one of um, the thousands of cases you, you, you have when you take Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, where we have all airstrikes. Um, and we expanded that also to look into Italy um, with, with some litigation as well, because the Sigonella Air Base in Italy is smaller than Rammstein, is less meaningful, but it's also still used by the US um, actually also to fly drones from there. That's something they don't do from Rammstein, but from Sigonella in Italy um, to use them for drone strikes in Libya, for example, where you have some proximity within the reach of the drones starting from the Italian Air Base. So, so the, we basically, we follow the global um, U.S. drone program, at least in some of the European 
um, states and try to challenge it there in courts, um, as Reprieve does, um, for example, in the UK. Um, so I'll stop here and <laughs> to hand over this to, to Barra to, um, to, to expand further. Yeah, but so how can you can you explain a little bit what is the role of reprieve uh, and what are you trying on the legal way to fight against that? Yeah, so um, reprieve, what it does, it's it carries out first of all the um, the uh, the field investigation. So the work um, that starts from immediately when a strike um, happens, or let's say. Um, in, in, in the case of the raid, for example, I happened, whenever an incident happens inside, um, inside the country like Yemen, we will carry out the, um, the field investigation. And um, um, uh, it's, um, it's actually more, uh, a lot of the work is really thanks to the uh, constant cooperation by the uh, local community and a local jo journalist and the local civil society are basically we usually are the backbone, if any, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of any work. A lot of people, yes, they see a lot of, uh, um, at, the end, at the end of it, you would, might see a court, you might see uh, uh, um, uh, lawyers in Berlin, but really the core of the work is thanks to the, uh, to the local civil society who, um, who carries out and help us really with most of the, uh, most of the investigation. Um, the, uh, then we try to find, uh, find, uh, find avenues. Reprieve heavily relies on what we call is the court of public opinion. We try to uh, enhance um, and, um, uh, and uh, tell the stories of those people to create a public opinion uh, that can uh, pressure at least uh, some change at the, uh, at the policymakers, whether it would be with parliamentarians here in the UK or in, uh, in the case of Germany, uh, um, Reprieve had engaged with many parliament members or, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of the US, it's, it's a lot of um, um, engagement with congressmen um, who, uh, who, who will be interested into seeing what their country is, is, is actually doing, doing abroad. In the specific case of Faisal bin Ali Jabir, we had the opportunity of taking him to the United States. He had the chance to meet congressmen and, and, con and uh, congresswomen uh, to, to tell them what had happened to his uh, family. Um, he, um, he, he spent a couple of weeks uh, meeting and talking to the, uh, to the, um, to the American press. Um, but of course, when it comes to the, uh, to the, to the litigation, the um, U.S. courts, we tried to, to go through a, to, uh, to, to a court in, in, in D.C., they dismissed, the, um, they dismissed the case, and they said it was simply because for national security reasons, they cannot reveal any information on how they made the decision to kill his relatives, because it will reveal... Um, sensitive information to their national uh, to their uh, to their national security and and it's always it's, it's, it's this always the case especially with the um, US court system is they can always invoke uh, state secrets or national security as a way to avoid uh, going through um, any um, any uh, legal uh, 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 legal proceedings uh, the same case of the family of Faisal bin Ali Jabir. Um, he, he, he went to Germany and thanks to our friends at the ECCHR, we started to see who other countries might have played a role into the killing of his, uh, of his uh, relatives. And in this case, there was a, a clear direct link with the base in, um, in, in, uh, in, in Germany. And they uh, and, and it opens a, 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 an avenue to, to to do a litigation in the in in uh, in the German courts with the help of the of the uh, of the uh, of the ESCHR. Um, there are also the the following case. Um, there was a case of um, the family I just told you about the Al Amiri and the families. families. The, the, the person I told you lost forty members of his. Of his uh, relatives, um, we uh, we are we are still in the proceed in in the process of providing them uh, uh, legal support. We submitted their case uh, to. Um, uh, I'm not sure how I can I can uh, I can explain it other than it's 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 a court based in in DC, 
but it covers it's um, it's one of the it's one of the basically um, a legal avenue that you can still uh, pursue because it covers um, the entire North America and South uh, and, uh, and and South America. So any states who have um, committed human rights violations, um, either they were in North America or in South America, you can uh, you can um, you can um, challenge that. Um, so the Inter-American Court. Yes, exactly. Inter okay. mm -hmm. Inter-American inter Court. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the legal procedures, of course, are always, um, are always uh, complicated, like any, um, any legal proceedings. But with the war and terror, you need to at least multiply that by 10, because you're dealing with a, uh, with a situation where really the American administration do not feel obliged to submit anything to the courts. Um, they feel they they can uh, uh, they can uh, they can uh, operate without providing you any any uh, any information. Whenever they try to challenge that in courts, they usually invoke state secrets. So basically, they have uh, they uh, they they don't feel the need to um, to um, to uh, engage with the uh, with the uh, um, uh, with the judge. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in this case, when the, uh, any of the individuals is not an American citizen, um, he basically does not have, seem, doesn't have, um, have, uh, um, have any rights. And, um, and, um, and, and, and it's, still a, it's still an ongoing, an, 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 an ongoing challenge, but, uh, but, uh, but again, um, it is. It is one of this. One of the. It's a situation where we hope that, with uh, enough public interest, with those uh, with those uh, cases, uh, all what we think they should do is treat non-Americans as Americans, as human beings. It's. It comes down to being that plain and simple. So we we have uh, we also focus very much on the fight against impunity in our organization, and we called this campaign or project Justice Heals. So my last question to you before we open to the public, I would like to know when you talk with the people, with your contacts in Yemen, what do they think about all these cases before courts? What is their reaction to this? Um, Especially when you tell about the frustrating experiences in the US. Um, it's um, it's very hard because when you first approach, you're trying to lower their expectations and basically convince them that I'm trying to talk to you, but that doesn't mean that by any case um, I can uh, promise you not to succeed. I cannot promise you even that you're going to have a hearing or you're going to have any form of uh, any form of uh, a due process that happens in um, in 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 quite in really in any normal. Uh, uh, um, a normal, you know, uh, a normal situation. Um, the um, uh, the uh, the uh, the challenge then arises. Then after they they give you uh, they give you authorization, you try to keep telling them repeatedly that uh, the United States actually does not adhere by international law. So don't have your uh, hopes high, because we're dealing with a state that basically doesn't feel to. Uh, the, the need actually to provide any, uh, any, um, any answers, as you said, acting with total impunity. Um, they would then ask, okay, are they going to provide, um, you know, are going to provide an apology? Are they going to uh, do, uh, you know, provide compensations? Even that, that's not, uh, that's not, uh, that's not uh, certain. And most of the cases you would tell them like, no, what we're trying really to do is just help bring your voice uh, for more people to um, to to hear about your uh, your stro uh, story, so your struggle is not you're not going through this uh, struggle alone, but we can find more more people who can who can uh, feel the need to uh, to um, uh, um, uh, uh, to engage. And um, I, um, um, I remember, and I and I would like to 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 to, to close with this is when the when the when the Black Lives Matter movement started to happen uh, last year, um, uh, people started, of course, to make the obvious and right comparison is, does Black lives in the United States or in, in other countries around the world equal uh, the lives of, you know, of uh, non, uh, uh, basically white, uh, white people? 
Do we think there is bias by the police? Do we think there's bias by the, uh, by, uh, the uh, judiciary, by the legal system in the US? Um, imagine a situation where, you, where basically you try to, to tell people, imagine you have another, an, a parallel to that, there is a, a, a different life. There are people who actually are, the, the, the US does not feel that they, it needs even to engage. They didn't, don't even recognize them as, you know, as, as just normal humans who have equal rights to, uh, to people living in the UK or in, or in, the, uh, or in, uh, or in the US. There's basically, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an open field where they think because of the, the, of the war on, on uh, the idea that the, we, we have an, a constant and ongoing war on, uh, war on, war on terror, uh, we need to be vigilant and we need to be, uh, we need to um, forget the rights of those, of those people in countries um, that are living far away, uh, far away from us. Um, uh, and, and, and again, I think the, the discussion should, should, should start moving into, um, there, there's nothing as a, such a war on terror in reality. The, the problem with what people would consider terrorist organizations violent organizations like Al-Qaeda, like others, it's a really an issue of law enforcement. You need to support law enforcement. You need to enhance the rule of law. Um, the idea that you are an ongoing war for 20 years with an enemy that's undefined and that can exist anywhere and, and everywhere around the, the, uh, around the, uh, around the, the globe. I mean, uh, it, 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 for me at least, and for many people just doesn't, um, doesn't make sense. Thank you so much. So uh, we have one question from the audience. So it's a question to you, Bara. Do you think that the anti-drone activist Ibrahim Motana, who died mm. in 2013, died of natural causes after, uh, after his death, the struggle against the drone war in Yemen lost an important face? Um, yes, of course. The struggle against the the, the drone war. Uh, uh, Brian Muthana is a is a uh, was a very bright um, uh, human rights activist from Yemen. Um, unfortunately, he died suddenly. I remember on on that night it was I was we were waiting for him to have a a, a town hall meeting, and he was the host of the event, and then he didn't show up. Mm -hmm. At night, we received the news from his family that he um, he he passed away, and he was uh, he was sleeping. I, uh, I do believe, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I do believe he died of, um, of uh, natural causes. Of course, as the Yemeni civil society in general, we lost a very uh, important and, and, uh, and uh, strong, uh, strong voice. And I remember he was one of the first people uh, to start to uh, mobilize us as activists in Change Square during the revolution. That we need to start paying attention to the uh, to the US uh, to the US uh, 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 drone program. Um, so yes, in in memory to to um, to Ibrahim Muthana, I think um, the the um, the Yemeni civil society owes him a lot in that uh, in that terms. Okay, so now we have the last chance for the audience to put some question under the F and A. And, and while we are waiting some seconds for perhaps another question, I would like to say to you, first of all, thank you very much for your contributions. And I wish you a lot of success for your legal steps that you will uh, also continue in the future. And please be aware that we, uh, are very, that we would like also to support you anyhow we can. So please count on us. Okay, it looks like there is no more question coming. So then I would like to give you the chance to make a last statement for the German public, because when we want, when we would like, as I said, we would like to um, publish the, this webinar video. So uh, I, would give, I would like to give you the chance at the end to make a statement. So what do you want to say to the German public? Um, yeah. I'm seeing there is might be a question that came came in the Ah yes you're right yes I see and it's an important one how can we from civil society help and support you 
Um, what I would say is um, is uh, the the uh, the the role of um, people, uh, especially civil society, in in um, in countries in Europe, the United Kingdom, the United States. Um, we can do we can do field investigation. We can document cases. We can uh, point out the all of the flaws that happen with this um, uh, with the with the with the either the drone program renditions um, and uh, uh, and the you know the the, the ongoing injustice um, happening with the Guantanamo. But eventually, the the decision making is really in in countries like again. Germany, UK, US, and so basically, it's 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 the role of the um, of the civil society, uh, like we saw strong mobilization when the Black Lives Matter um, movement happened. Is you, you, we need to see a similar or even something close to an, an engagement from from uh, from the civil uh, uh, society. The second thing is I would say is. Um, the role of uh, civil society in, in Europe when it comes to helping people inside Yemen is uh, basically try to be their voices. That's the main thing they try to, they, 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 uh, they, uh, they lack because they can, they can do a lot of activism in their own, uh, in their own uh, uh, in, uh, environments. And, and I saw that firsthand during the Arab Spring. I, I saw Yemeni public coming out in mass, mass numbers and basically saying, basically, I felt that's the moment I felt we have a strong, we have an, a very beautiful story to tell. We have something to, to, to tell to the wider international community. Um, uh, and, and it's basically the, the, the role of people like us in, in the Yemeni civil society to, uh, to do that. But when it comes to people outside is try to be their voices. That's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's what I, I would say. And, uh, and try to prioritize what the local community and the local civil society tells you is the, is the priority at the, at, the, at the moment. And for example, when there is an, an, an injustice happening, for example, hence the, those executions that took place over the, uh, the, uh, the, the weekend, try to help them, try to help those mothers and, and families to, to, uh, to have a wider audience. And um, usually uh, the, this is the, uh, there is a phrase that usually um, I saw. I usually, I usually when I when I open the Washington Post, to say um, dictatorship flourishes in the dark, or you know atrocities flourishes in the in the in the dark. And basically, it's the same story here. When there are more people talking about it, um, and 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 more wider engagement, it becomes harder for um, atrocities to keep carried on. It is harder for you know people to act with impunity. Uh, when more and more people are uh, are talking about it, and um, talking about, for example, those executions that took place in the weekend, the Houthis have um, ordered also the execution. There's eleven more people are waiting, including yeah. two uh, two women. Uh, so try basically to um, to uh, to to tell that story, and civil society in the U.S. and the U.K. have better resources. They have access to media much, much better than, you know, a local community inside, uh, inside, uh, um, uh, inside Yemen. So you will be in a better position to tell the story of, a, if, of, of you know, of those, of the local so civil society in Yemen uh, than those. So basically that, that would be my, my, sincere, uh, my, uh, uh, my sincere advice. And I, and I always believe there is, there is, there is always uh, this form of collaboration that can, uh, that can, uh, that can take place, uh, we can, where we can link the work of those people who are on the ground with organizations here, and then eventually, you know, affecting or changing um, the uh, the decision making process. Uh, I would like to please you to send me information about these eleven persons still um, you you mentioned, uh, because then we can put this information um, to the mm. for the German public. So and if there are participants that want to get this information, they can just write me and we can forward it. Um, there's another question that perhaps leads to a final statement. <laughs> Do you expect that after the German elections, human rights will play a more important role in foreign policy? That's for you both. I think Andreas would be in a <laughs> better position to, <laughs> to answer this. 
Yeah, I'm happy to do so. Um, let me maybe just briefly um, also add something to what Barra um, said and, and referred to. Um, when, when we speak to um, survivors, to families um, of, of atrocities in the war on terror in Yemen, but also be it Iraq, be it, be it Afghanistan, so many of them... Um, you know, don't don't want revenge, but they ask. Um, um, I want to use um, the courts. I, I I trust in the rule of law, and and that's how I want to address the injustice I face, my family face, um, and I don't want to revenge or take up arms to um, to, to to counter um, injustice or violence the family experience and. And then you need to tell them that basically the, the, the courts are hardly accessible to you. Um, um, the rule of law is basically not 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 applicable equally in in, in those cases. And I think that's that's um, um, extremely um, frustrating and and also dangerous because I mean the, it's it's the view that people have from the U.S. from from Europe that there is a rule of law that you can go there to court if something happens to you and so on. And then in those cases, you need to basically um, play down expectations that um, you know we 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 can try, but but that um, um, what Barra just said it's extremely limited um, what what we can achieve here and what you can trust in. And, um, so basically, um, these are also kind of double standards we talk about that um, I mean, even those people here who, who face major injustice believe in the rule of law, but they, it's, it's not made for, for them. And, and I think that's one of the major problems we would have to address here. Um, and, but I always find it quite remarkable um, when people speak to us um, coming from those traumatic experiences, that's, that's what they um, basically want to and, and what they um, ask us uh, um, to help them with. Um, uh, yeah, to, to answer the question, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pessimistic because, again, it goes back to the um, double standards question, whoever will form the next German government, you know, um, of, of course, um, Germany praises itself for um, 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 respecting human rights or demanding human rights on international level, international fora, and 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 so on. But I mean, you need to see um, whose human rights, in which situations, for whom, and how it plays into international um, politics um, and and foreign relations. And um, and I think that's that, that's that's the issue here. If if if, if you have a um, human rights-led foreign policy needs to uh, be applied um, um, equally, and that, um, for example, um, if, if, you, if you see how how, how the, all the drone strikes um, are are handled, how Rammstein Air Base is handled, how Germany is silent actually about um, mm -hmm. the law applicable in in in, in on drone strikes. Um, um, I mean, Germany was more vocal on opposing the. In, war in Iraq um, was a bit more vocal also in, um, on, on, on enemy combatants, um, but on, on, on the drone war and after a um, number of years of the war on terror, um, Germany also um, became more and more silent. And um, um, I mean, of course, I always hope this will change, that there will be a stronger stance for human rights, that it's, it plays a more important role uh, in foreign policy also when it comes to um, the, Within Europe, to other allies, um, also vis-à-vis -vis Turkey and, and and other states, um, but I have my doubts that uh, much will change um, after the elections. Uh, of course, it depends a bit on the government, but but all over, um, not so optimistic. Which also means that we um, need to keep fighting for that, and as Barra said, also need to. Um, tell the stories of those uh, whose human rights are violated and who are basically um, left behind by Germany and other states. Thank you so much. Was there another one? No, I think there's no more question left. So again, if you would like to make a last statement, go ahead. So what is what would be important for you, Bara, to tell, especially to the public here of this, uh, of this webinar? 
Um, well, what I would say is um, is um, is basically um, there is a there is an era where uh, where we've we went through uh, since the beginning of the so-called uh, war uh, uh, um, uh, war on terror, and um, I remember I was a I was a a, a kid when 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 the um, when uh, the this when I started to hear this term following the. The attacks of um, of of nine uh, of nine eleven, um, but um, um, from 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 um, from that period, if you if if um, if we have a an entire generation who were raised, um, um, especially in those affected communities, that the idea of there is an erosion of the rule of law, there is an uh, erosion of um, international law, there is less respect to. Um, uh, um, you know, um, uh, international standards when it comes to how um, how um, um, how uh, big countries or you know uh, um, uh, powerful countries can uh, can do or um, uh, interpret you know interpret the uh, the, the 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 use of um, of uh, of um, when it comes to you know places like Guantanamo or anything mm -hmm. um, I think we need to be careful to what are we sending a message to the um, to the uh, to the future uh, as I said for example Guantanamo will be a stain in in the history of the of the of the United States but also in the on the uh, history and legacy of the uh, western uh, western uh, civilizations in general that it actually it's happened it actually people were being held indefinitely without the trials and people at a certain time said it was it was uh, it was okay um, and the um, the uh, the uh, the the second thing is um, I remember uh, uh, very clearly there was um, a phrase by um, uh, one of uh, he was the top al-qaeda strategist at the time and he was the second right hand to Osama bin Laden uh, before the uh, when when the when the, the the war on terror started to develop, he uh, his name is Abu Hafs al Masri, and he died I think in Afghanistan during during the war in Afghanistan. He he basically said that we need to do an action uh, similar to Pearl Harbor that would bring the United States to us. It was his idea mm -hmm. that actually we need to do something big that would invoke a reaction that the United States would act irrationally. In a, in a very irrational way, in a very aggressive way, that would look like actually this is actually a, a clash of two civilizations. There's actually a Western civilization trying to, he counted, and, and, and that's very important, he, he counted that the United States would not stop at Afghanistan. They would not just come to Afghanistan, they would go to the Middle East. And if it goes to the Middle East with all of, you know, all of the colonial history or all of that, the mindset, mm -hmm. he, he was counting that actually more and more people are going to just rise up and join uh, uh, join Al Qaeda cause. The two things that happened, the United States did react. So he basically he did see into the future, and he actually saw that the United States will be acting in an irrational way, and invaded uh, uh, Iraq. And many countries are basically waiting who's next. Uh, the second thing, which is very important, not many people actually joined Al Qaeda. There are more people today who are very um, uh, very vigilant and very, uh, very much um, uh, against Al Qaeda from countries in Afghanistan to Yemen, and, and 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 you could see that when you see women protesting in Afghanistan, speaking about their rights, talking about democracy, about the rule of law, about their future, about good, uh, good, uh, uh, good governance. Meaning, there is the generation is uh, the, the 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 generation um, that that have created, and and we saw that of of course with the. Uh, Arab uh, with the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was an entire different generation. They they've been brought up with the with with you know with uh, ha having to, the right to dream and a, and, a, and a new future, a democracy, and 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 building a better future for their. We, we they don't think that we were doomed with you know with with terrorism um, uh, the same way like you know uh, Al Qaeda has envisioned for the uh, for the for the region. So in other words, I would say it's. It's not. It's not actually a, a, a. It's not actually determined. There is no clash of civilizations as, as many people either in the West or in the Middle East uh, think uh, think it is. We need to say that actually no. We we can have cooler heads. We can have leaders who would um, uh, lead uh, uh, in a in a in a better vision, promising a better future. 
promising um, uh, a, a, a new era for not just to the for, for the United States and Europe, but actually viewing that actually the people in this region have equal rights. They do have similar demands. They dream of the future and want to see their, you know, their, their countries come to become a democracy like Germany, like the UK, like the US and, and, and other places around the world. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, so I would like to tell the audience that on Friday we continue our series with the, with the conflict in Sahel and in East Africa. This will be, uh, will be translated from French into German. And on Monday we are going to discuss with Manfred Novak. He's the former Special Rapporteur on Torture for the UN. And there we will discuss the issue of the torture in the frame of the war on terror again and more in detail. So I hope that some of you will be there too. I wish you all a very nice evening. And um, thank you very much, Andreas. Thank you, Bada. And I wish you all the best for your future. Thank you. And we will be in touch. Thank you so yes. much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. All the best to you.